Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ellen, for the nice introduction and for inviting me to speak. Uh, and thanks to our friends at the Howe Library uh, and from Still North for helping to make the event possible. Um, I just say for those of you who haven't met before, uh, our family moved to uh, the Hanover area in 2018 when I started working at Dartmouth College. We live about 10 minutes from here in Edna on Quail Drive. So uh, you might see me running around town. Often it's usually what I do in the morning. First thing is get up and run uh, three to 10 miles. So if you see me out there on the road, give away. Um, I was telling Michael beforehand, uh, I've had a chance to talk about this book all over the place in the last month, which has been amazing. Um, this is actually the first chance I've had to talk about the book in Hanover. And so I really appreciate the invitation to talk with the local audience. Um, one of my favorite questions uh, that I received over this last month is what motivated me to write the book. And I'd like to start there. So like most American historians, I've made extensive use of digitized newspapers in both my research and teaching. In 2019, for example, I published a digital book with Stanford University Press called Black Quotidian, Everyday History in African American Newspapers. The project features 365 short posts on historical newspaper articles, one for each day of the year, as well as introductory chapters on the history of black newspapers. The project is available for free at blackquotidian.org if you're interested in checking it out. In the course of doing the research for Black Quotidian, I kept coming across pictures like this, highlighting some of the more than one million black men and women who served America during World War II. This one is from the Minneapolis Spokesman, the longest continuously operating black newspaper in Minnesota. There are thousands of pictures and stories like these in black newspapers across the country. Seeing these local stories in digitized newspapers made me curious. I wondered what type of experiences during the war might be missing from our history textbooks. I wondered what the war looked like from the African-American perspective. This curiosity ultimately led me to research my new book. So my presentation this afternoon is from a book that just came out called Half American. It aims to tell the definitive history of Black Americans in World War II. It's available now from Viking Books and in the back from our friends at Still North. And I'm excited to give you a sneak peek of some of the research. <laughs> Let me start by taking us back 80 years. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941, James Thompson, a 26-year-old from Wichita, Kansas, could not sleep. He registered with the Selective Service the prior year, and now, with the U.S. declaring war on Japan and Germany, it was only a matter of time before he was drafted. The prospect of war was frightening for many civilians, but something else was on his mind on that cold Kansas night. Sitting in his family's home in a vibrant black neighborhood amidst a segregated American city, Thompson wrote a letter expressing the concerns that he and many other black Americans felt about joining a racially segregated military. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American, Thompson asked. Will things be better for the next generation in the peace to follow? Would it be demanding too much to demand full citizenship rights in exchange for the sacrificing of my life? Is the kind of America I know worth defending? Printed in the Pittsburgh Courier, an influential black newspaper, Thompson's letter launched the African-American double victory campaign during World War II to secure victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. I have not been able to shake these words from my head as I worked on this book over the past seven years. Should I sacrifice my life to live half American? These words are as relevant today as they were some eight decades ago. My goal in writing this book is to enable Americans to reckon with the real history of the war and its present day consequences. As a historian, I'm troubled by the collective amnesia in US politics and media around racism. It permeates daily interactions, in communities across the country. This ignorance has consequences. When Americans celebrate the country's victory in World War II, but forget that the US Armed Forces were segregated, that the Red Cross segregated blood donors, that Black World War II veterans returned to the country only to be denied jobs and housing, or that Black vets were attacked and murdered for violating the color line, it becomes all the more difficult to talk honestly about racism in the present. During our time together today, I'd like to focus on the roles Black troops played at Pearl Harbor and D-Day, as well as how Black veterans helped lead the civil rights movement after the war. The story begins on one of the most pivotal days in American history. 
Shortly before 8 a.m. on December 7th, 1941, mess attendant second class Doris Miller was in the galley of the USS West Virginia, gathering dirty laundry, when he heard the low drone of dozens of planes flying over Pearl Harbor's battleship road. Miller, a black messman from Waco, Texas, was about to distinguish himself as a hero during the attack that drew the United States into World War II. He heard a bugle call for a fire and rescue crew, distant but getting closer. Initially, he thought it was a drill, but then he remembered it was Sunday morning, an unusual time for so much commotion. Miller struggled, as Miller struggled to comprehend what was happening, a torpedo struck the West Virginia, dislodging the rudder and sending a giant geyser of water over the ship's stack and crashing down the deck. Minutes later, more torpedoes pounded the West Virginia, knocking out the electricity and causing the ship to list rapidly to port. As the general alarm sounded, Miller rushed to his battle station in the middle of the ship. When he arrived, he saw that his station had been destroyed by the barrage. Amidst the explosions and anti-aircraft fire, Miller heard officers calling for all available men to go topside. A former high school football player and shipboard boxing champion, the 22-year-old Miller was strong and athletic, but he had trouble navigating his six foot three inch, 200 pound frame through the dark smoke-filled corridors of the tilting and flooding ship. Torpedoes and bombs continued to rock the ship, tossing those below deck into hard metal walls and flinging men above deck into the flaming, oil-choked harbor water. When Miller finally made a topside, the morning's chaos came into clearer view. The planes bore the Empire of Japan's red ball symbol. From the deck of the West Virginia, he could see flames and giant plumes of smoke coming from the nearby USS Arizona and USS Oklahoma. The West Virginia had been stationed at Pearl Harbor for months to guard against a potential attack, and Miller knew black messmen on the other ships. On shore leave, the messmen would swap stories about ports they had visited in the Caribbean and South America, and about the indignities, large and small, of cooking and cleaning for white officers. They wondered when the United States would officially enter the World War. Now, with smoke blotting out the sun over Oahu, they had their answer. Miller had little time to process the horrible realities of war unfolding before him. On the upper deck, Lieutenant Commander spotted Miller and enlisted the powerful Texan to help him carry the ship's commander, whose abdomen had been sliced open by a piece of metal from a bomb explosion. Using a makeshift stretcher, Miller helped move his mortally wounded captain to a sheltered spot below the navigation bridge. A lieutenant then ordered Miller to quickly follow him to a pair of unmanned 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine guns. Despite having no training on the ship's weapons, Miller loaded ammunition and fired at the Japanese planes that continued to buzz overhead. It wasn't hard, Miller later recalled. I just pulled the trigger and she worked fine. I would watched the others with these guns. I guess I fired her for about 15 minutes. I think I got one of those Japanese planes. They were diving pretty close to us. Their ammunition spent, Miller and his lieutenant used a fire hose to beat back flames on the deck and pulled several sailors out of the burning water. With the West Virginia sinking into the harbor, Miller and his surviving shipmates climbed hand over hand down a rope suspended from a boat crane into the water. They swam nearly a quarter mile to shore, dodging patches of flaming oil as the bodies of their fallen countrymen floated in the water. Japanese planes continued to menace the skies. What would be several weeks before Miller's name was released to the public, word quickly spread that a black messman had performed heroically at Pearl Harbor. This story resonated with African Americans because over the prior decade, military leaders had gone out of their way to disparage black servicemen. The army argued that black people lacked the intelligence, courage, and skill to serve in combat and relegated black troops to service roles. At the start of the war, the Marine Corps did not allow any black men to serve. In the Navy, policies dictated that black Americans could only be drafted or volunteer for the Messman branch, where they would serve and feed white officers. And all of the military was racially segregated. This policy of segregation was costly and inefficient because it required the construction and maintenance of separate and redundant training facilities, as well as additional logistical planning for troop transportation and deployments. Segregation made no sense for a military that was about to fight a global war on an unprecedented scale. For Black Americans, Doris Miller's heroism at Pearl Harbor was a rebuke of the military's policy of segregation. 
Miller showed that black men could perform bravely in combat if only given the opportunity. Enemy torpedoes made no distinction between white sailors and black messmen, they argued. So why should the Navy? This anger flowed through the pages of the black press after Pearl Harbor. The front page headline in the Chicago Defender after the attack read, Awake, white America, the hour is at hand. The editors wrote, White America must now learn that a Negro in the armed service of his country, in the uniform of his government, must be respected as a defender of democracy. He cannot be insulted in this uniform that now represents a sacred cause. He must not be spat upon, jailed, beaten, cursed, and otherwise abused and tormented as the case has been, then called upon to sacrifice his life for those who hold his patriotism so cheaply. Before striking back against Japan, the newspaper called for white Americans to first bomb the color line. <coughs> the Defender's front page also profiled three young Chicagoans who heeded the radio appeals from army recruiters to remember Pearl Harbor and attempted to volunteer for military service. 21-year-old Edgar Davis, 19-year-old Louis Grady, and 20-year-old Mitchell Jordan stood in line with hundreds of men, but were turned away by the recruiting officer because the Army did not have enough all-black units to accommodate them. Don't you accept American citizens in this Army? Davis asked. Just imagine what this would feel like to volunteer to serve your country after the attack on Pearl Harbor, only to be turned away because of the color of your skin. It was humiliating and infuriating. In the editorial page of the crisis, Roy Wilkins argued that 13 million black Americans were fighting for a new world, which shall not only not contain a Hitler, but not Hitlerism, a world in which lynching, brutality, terror, humiliation, and degradation through segregation and discrimination shall have no place either here or there. Wilkins charged that the fight against Hitlerism must begin in Washington, D.C. and must attack the military system of racial segregation. A lily white navy cannot fight for a free world, he argued. A Jim Crow army cannot fight for a free world. <clears throat> it was not enough to fight for freedom and democracy on foreign battlefields if freedom and democracy remained out of reach for black Americans at home. Doris Miller was not the only black American at Pearl Harbor, and the sacrifices these black messmen made during the attack were nowhere more evident than in the communities that mourned them. In Birmingham, Alabama, more than 300 people filled the pews at 16th Street Baptist Church for a memorial service to honor Julius Ellsbury, a 20-year-old mess attendant first class on the USS Oklahoma. Ellsbury volunteered for the Navy as soon as he turned 18, and on the morning of December 7th, he helped several shipmates reach safety before he was killed. As his parents and six younger siblings sat in the church's front row, his mother thought of how Julius had written her just days before the attack to apologize for missing Christmas for the second year in a row. He enclosed a money order to buy presents for the family. The next letter she received was an official telegram from the Navy, saying that her son was lost in action in the line of duty and in the service of his country. She was devastated to lose her son. Nothing could bring Julius back, but she took pride in seeing his Navy picture displayed prominently in homes and businesses throughout her black Birmingham with the message, Remember Pearl Harbor. The local newspaper editor compared Ellsbury to Crispus Attucks, the black hero who was the first American, to ki first American killed in the American Revolution. The editor wrote, no man, not even an admiral, can give more to his country than his life. Even as black Americans joined their fellow citizens in preparing for war abroad, they continued to fight racism and violence at home. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, a 26-year-old mill worker named Cleo Wright was brutally lynched in Sykes, Missouri. The killing sent shockwaves throughout the country. Civil rights activists called for a federal investigation, and dozens of ordinary black citizens also wrote to President Roosevelt, including a Brooklyn father who asked, is this the kind of democracy we're trying to teach the world? A black army draftee encouraged his fellow soldiers to remember Cleo as we die for democracy. The New York Times suggested the lynching gave comfort to the Nazis, while the Cleveland Column Post wrote that the Missouri mob proved to America and the world that they could out Hitler Hitler in brutal savagery. Several newspapers stressed the lynching's international implications, 
noting that both Germany and Japan used the lynching as propaganda. In Missouri, local civil rights activists organized a mass rally in St. Louis. Over 3,500 people filled the YMCA gymnasium and listened to speakers call for federal anti-lynching legislation. Protesters carried signs reading, Remember Pearl Harbor, Remember Sykeston II. This slogan caught on and it was repeated at protest meetings in black newspapers across the country over the next several months. Just weeks after Pearl Harbor, the stakes of World War II were clear for black America. Defeating the Axis powers was an important national priority to which thousands of black people, for which thousands of black people would risk their lives. But defeating fascism on foreign battlefields was only half the fight. Victory would be incomplete unless it also uprooted racism in America. These dual war aims coalesced under a slogan that came to define the black American experience during World War II, double victory. If Pearl Harbor is one of the defining moments of World War II, another is D-Day. Here again, the story looks very different from the African-American perspective. By the time the sun rose over the English Channel on D-Day, June 6, 1944, most of the men in the 582nd Engineer Dump Truck Company were already seasick. Salt water sprayed their faces as the ship bobbed and swayed in the chop. Overhead, B-17 flying fortresses, B-24 liberators, and B-26 marauders raced toward the shore. The engineers heard and felt the Allied bombs and battleship guns pounding Hitler's Atlantic wall of trenches, pillboxes, and bunkers that fortified the French coast. Each blast felt like a, a concussive punch. Looking to either side of their transport ship, the engineers saw hundreds of vessels, many with large silver anti-aircraft balloons floating above them. The balloons were tethered to the ships and manned by the 320th Barrage Balloon Battalion, a black unit whose men were assigned to protect more than 150 vessels during the channel crossing. The engineers learned about the 320th earlier in the year when both units were stationed in England. Amidst the drone of airplane engines and the thump of explosions, Seeing these silver balloons lifted the engineer's spirits. It was a clear sign that other black troops were in the largest Amada ever assembled. When the 582nd landed at Utah Beach mid-morning on D-Day, they immediately set to work. Their job was to destroy the steel and log obstacles the Nazis installed on the beach, carry ashore and install bridge equipment, and haul away landmines. Nazi bullets did not discriminate and the black engineers faced heavy machine gun fire as they prepared the landing zone. The engineers enabled thousands and thousands of infantry troops to safely reach the beach and then pushed up the steep coast to open an exit for allied troops to move inland. Other black units landed at Normandy on D-Day, including quartermaster companies and port battalions, about 1,700 black troops in all. That these troops were not classified as combat soldiers made no difference to enemy machine gunners or snipers. Amphibious truck drivers, called ducks, faced enemy fire while bringing troops and supplies ashore. Hollywood filmmaker John Ford was on the beach on D-Day, directing a Coast Guard camera crew. He marveled at the bravery of black troops. He said, I remember watching one black driver in a duck loaded with supplies. He dropped them on the beach, unloaded, went back for more. Shells landed around him. The Germans were really after him. He avoided every obstacle and just kept going back and forth, back and forth, completely calm. I thought, by God, if anybody deserves a medal, that man does. Ford considered leaving his relatively safe place on the beach to get a photograph of the soldier, but thought better of it. The hell with it, Ford thought. I was willing to admit that he was braver than I was. Landing in different zones on Utah and Omaha beaches, members of the 320th Balloon Battalion searched for each other amidst the chaos of battle. After nightfall, they worked in groups of three and four to launch dozens, dozens of their hydrogen-filled balloons over the beaches. The balloons hovered at low altitudes, making it more challenging for German planes to strafe the coast or accurately drop their bombs. Enemy planes that dared to fly low risked hitting the thin steel cables armed with explosives that dangled from the balloons. These floating mines formed a silver curtain of defense along the coast. Waverly Woodson Jr., a pre-med student at Philadelphia's Lincoln University and medic with the 320th, performed heroically on D-Day. En route to Omaha Beach, 
His landing craft hit a mine and was torn apart by a Nazi shell. The man next to him was blown up, and Woodson feared that his own shrapnel wounds would kill him. Another medic bandaged Woodson's gashes as the ship drifted to shore. Woodson waded through chest high water and scrambled for shelter on the beach. He set up a medical aid station, and over the next 30 hours, he tended to more than 200 wounded men. He patched wounds, removed bullets, and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a soldier's foot and saved three men from drowning. Black newspapers hailed Woodson as the number one invasion hero, and the military newspaper, Stars and Stripes, said Woodson and his fellow medics covered themselves with glory on D-Day. The Army awarded Woodson and four other black medics the Bronze Star, the service's fourth highest award. Woodson's commanding officer recommended that he receive the Distinguished Service Cross, and General John Lee felt that Woodson deserved the Medal of Honor, the Army's highest honor. These recommendations were ignored. None of the 433 Medals of Honor awarded during the war were bestowed on black troops. Landing thousands of troops on D-Day was an amazing feat, but it was only the first part of the battle. Reinforcing and supplying these soldiers as they pushed across the countryside and hedgerows was the second and larger phase. By the end of June, the Allies landed 850,000 troops and 150,000 vehicles in Normandy. D-Day simply stood for Day of the Invasion. Thousands of troops landed on the French coast on D-Day plus one, D-Day plus two, and in the weeks thereafter. All of these men required food, ammunition, and replacement parts for airplanes, tanks, and trucks. Black troops were even more important during this phase because they were the backbone of the Army's service and supply units. As American combat forces pushed into Nazi-occupied France, they could only go as far as their supply lines would take them, which meant they could only go as far as black supply troops would take them. Black troops were everywhere after D-Day. <coughs> General service engineers removed thousands of mines and repaired railroad tracks. Duck drivers zipped back and forth across the channel, ferrying materials from port to coast, then carrying supplies inland. The 320th manned their silver curtain of barrage balloon, preventing Nazi planes from dropping to strafing altitudes. They were joined by black anti-aircraft gunners, on a hilltop above the beaches, who watched the sky for enemy planes. After helping secure Utah Beach, the 382nd used their dump trucks to carry troops 50 miles west of the important port of Cherbourg and evacuate wounded soldiers and prisoners, dodging mines and machine gun fire on the roads. The engineers carried members of the 82nd uh, Airborne Division to the front, and the paratroopers dubbed the truck drivers the paradumpers. Just miles behind the front, Quartermasters baked and transported bread every day, using mobile mixers, ovens, and toasters. Black service troops also buried many of the nearly 23,000 Americans who died in and around Normandy. Burying the dead was important for both morale and sanitation. It was backbreaking and emotionally devastating work. Neat rows of crosses belied the gruesome tasks of battlefield cleanup and burying fellow soldiers. One grave registration troop said, not many of us were killed, but we died in different ways. Although the D-Day contributions of black troops would be obscured over time, contemporary journalists praised their efforts. Visiting France in August, New York Times war correspondent Raymond Daniel compared witnessing the work black service and supply troops were doing to going backstage in the theater. He wrote, I got a glimpse of the scene shifters, stagehands, and electricians who contributed their unseen parts to the drama unfolding before the eyes of those in front of the footlight. Here were the men and machinery behind the lines, whose toil and sweat had made possible the victorious whitening thrust of our armies toward Paris and the Seine. You could say black troops during World War II were the essential workers of their day. By October, Allied troops, led by General George Patton, General Bernard Montgomery, and Lieutenant General Omar Bradley, had advanced more than 400 miles, liberating Paris and Brussels and entering Western Germany. Time magazine said it was the miracle of supply that put the Nazis on their heels. Ollie Stewart, a black war correspondent, wrote, although port battalions and work troops are not generally regarded on par with frontline combat troops, it is a matter of record that no group of soldiers in this theater has done more to make Allied victory possible. They liberate no towns, see no flags, drink no champagne, nor kiss happy girls. Yet when things become critical, the first cry of high command is, 
give us more supplies. The heart of the Allies' supply effort in Western Europe was a truck convoy driven mostly by black quartermaster troops called the Red Ball Express. The name came from a railway tradition where railmen marked priority cars with a red dot. As three dozen divisions fought their way across France and Belgium, the Allies had to move 20,000 tons of supplies every day from the invasion beaches to the, to the front. General Bradley later said, logistics, this was the dullest subject in the world, but logistics were the lifeblood of the Allied armies in France. Without the black truck drivers and the supplies they delivered, Allied forces could not move, shoot, or eat. With most of the French railway system in ruins, the Allies turned to a fleet of thousands of six by six, two and a half ton General Motors cargo trucks, nicknamed the Jimmy or Deuce and a Half. These trucks and the black men who drove them made the U.S. Army the most mobile and mechanized force in the war and gave the Allies a decided strategic advantage over German infantry divisions, which were overly reliant on rail, and rail, wagon trains, and horses to move troops and supplies. From August through November 1944, 23,000 American truck drivers and cargo loaders, 70% of whom were black, moved more than 400,000 tons of ammunition, gasoline, medical supplies, and rations to battlefronts in France, Belgium, and Germany. A typical German division during the same time frame had nearly 10 times as many horses as motor vehicles. This limited the range of the vaunted Blitzkrieg or lightning attacks because German tank and motorized units could not move far ahead of their infantry divisions and supplies. In contrast, when the Allies reached the Seine River nearly two weeks earlier than expected, the truck convoy allowed the Allies to chase the retreating German armies without outrunning their supply lines. <coughs> General Patton concluded that the two and a half ton truck is our most valuable weapon, and Colonel John D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander's son, argued that without the Red Bull truck drivers, the advances across France could not have been made. Back across the Channel, the ports in and around London continued to hum with war activity. In the six months after D-Day, the port of Southampton was the busiest in the world. More than 6,400 vessels left Southampton bound for France, carrying nearly 2 million military personnel, 170,000 vehicles, and over 1.7 million tons of supplies. Black troops made up more than 90% of these port companies in Southampton, more than half the trunk companies, and almost all of its quartermaster and engineer general service regiments. Almost everything the Allies transported to the front passed through the hands of at least one Black American. The Allies pushed towards Germany would have sputtered to a halt without these black port troops working around the clock. And it wasn't just men. Major Charity Adams led the 688th Central Postal Directive Battalion, who made sure troops in the European theater received mail from home. Black American nurses had already served in Australia, Africa, and England. But with more than 800 members, this postal battalion was by far the largest unit of black women to serve overseas during the war. Working in unheated warehouses with windows blacked out to prevent light showing during nighttime air raids, the women worked in shifts around the clock. They adopted the motto, no mail, low morale. They processed an average of 65,000 pieces of mail per shift and developed systems to get letters to their intended recipients. This was no simple task because units were moving constantly and thousands of soldiers had common names like Robert Smith. Having spent the past seven years researching this book, I can say definitively that Black Americans played a vital role in helping the Allies win the war. <clears throat> when Black veterans came home at the end of the war, however, they returned to a country that disrespected their service and was openly hostile to them and their communities. On June 29, 1945, for example, Mississippi Senator James O. Eastland rose to speak on the floor of the Senate. He described black soldiers as dismal failures in combat and said they have disgraced the flag of their country. Eastland and his ilk understood that black Americans greeted victory abroad by redoubling their efforts to fight for civil rights at home, and that black veterans were important leaders in this battle for freedom and equality. For Americans committed to upholding Jim Crow segregation, black veterans in their military service were extremely dangerous. That day on the floor of the Senate, Eastland described African Americans as an inferior race, before concluding, 
I am proud that the purest form of white blood flows in my veins. I know that the white race is a superior race. It has ruled the world. It has given us civilization. It is responsible for all the progress on Earth. If these words are upsetting today, imagine how they sounded to black veterans who had risked their lives and saw their buddies killed fighting for freedom and democracy abroad. This is where we can see the biggest difference in what World War II meant for black Americans. While America achieved a military victory over Germany and Japan in 1945, that was not the end of the war for black Americans. An equally important battle against racism continued on the home front. After four years of brutal war, returning to the way things used to be was obviously appealing to millions of white citizens. But it was the exact opposite of what black Americans were demanding. For black Americans, returning to normal meant going back to a system of legalized racial apartheid in the South, where racial hierarchies were enforced through lynching and voter disenfranchisement. It meant riding in the back of the bus, stepping off the sidewalk to let a white person pass, and being denied access to lunch counters and swimming pools, all in order to remind you that you were a second-class citizen. In all regions of the country, return to normal for black Americans and being harassed and beaten by police, not being able to get a mortgage to live in most neighborhoods, attending segregated and under-resourced schools, and being the last hired and first fired in the workplace. The last thing black people wanted was a return to a country that treated them as half American. They saw the war as part of a much larger struggle to take democracy off of parchment and give it life. That's what the Double Victory Campaign was about, making America a democracy for everyone. Black veterans swelled the ranks of civil rights organizations and became key players in black freedom struggles all across the country. I'll reference just a few names here. Reverend Hosea Williams, who earned a Purple Heart in France serving as an infantryman under General Patton, was beaten almost to death when he tried to drink from a white-only water fountain in Savannah, Georgia, after the war. He worked alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to lead black voter registration drives in the South. Women's Army Corps veteran W. Johnson Roundtree used the GI Bill to attend Howard University Law School. She established a law firm in Washington, D.C., and in the landmark civil rights case, Sarah Keyes versus Carolina Coach Company, helped secure a ban on racial segregation in interstate bus travel. Veteran Oliver Brown protested school segregation in Topeka, Kansas. His daughter, Linda Brown, was one of the students at the center of the historic Brown versus Board of Education decision. Medgar Evers voted cargo for the black truck drivers on the Red Ball Express, who transported supplies across France after D-Day. After earning two bronze stars on the beachhead of Normandy and in northern France, Evers celebrated his 21st birthday in 1946 by leading a group of black veterans who attempted to register to vote in Decatur, Mississippi, only to be turned away by a white mob with guns. He said, I had been on Omaha Beach. All we black soldiers wanted was to be ordinary citizens. We fought during the war for America, Mississippi included. Now, after the Germans and Japanese hadn't killed us, it looked as though the white Mississippians would. Evers continued to fight for civil rights until he was assassinated in 1963. He was buried with full military honors at Arlington National Cemetery. Robert P. Madison paused his studies at Howard University to serve as a second lieutenant in the 92nd Infantry Division during the war where he earned a Purple Heart in combat in Italy. After the war, he earned architectural degrees from Case Western and Harvard before returning to his hometown of Cleveland to establish a trailblazing architectural firm. He helped design the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, among other buildings. Late in his life, Madison described a trip to a bookstore. He said, I saw this great big volume on World War II, and I leafed through it. I didn't see one reference to any black soldiers or any black airmen at all in the book. We were a forgotten group of people. Today, there are fewer than 300,000 living American World War II veterans, including approximately 30,000 black veterans. I wrote this book for those veterans. Their stories deserve to be part of how we remember the war. Stories of World War II that do not reckon with the experience of black Americans leave us ill-prepared to understand the present and rudderless as we try to navigate the future. Ignorance is a luxury that we cannot afford. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can meet the resurgence of explicit racism 
as a deeply entrenched aspect of our country's political and cultural life, rather than as a surprise or an anomaly. If we tell the right stories about the war, we can see modern battles over voting rights and racial justice as a continuation of decades-long struggles to make America an actual functioning democracy. And if we tell the right stories about the war, we can finally honor the sacrifices of the Black veterans, defense industry workers, and citizens who fought on foreign battlefields and in their own cities and towns so that no one would ever again be treated as half American. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Mm -hmm. Field questions from folks who are here, uh, physically present in the audience, and there's some questions that might come in via Zoom, and so we'll be able to come back and forth. Were there questions on, did anybody put questions in the chat? Not yet, but we'll keep an eye on it. I happened to watch a film. Can they speak up, please? Just yesterday I was what, watching a short film, uh, pieces of film that were taken uh, on the liberation of the camps in Europe. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> um, one of the survivors said he looked up and he saw a black face <laughs> and then they had a quotation from the black soldier which is really powerful yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that so the, the um question I remember was that it, having just watched a, a, a short video where uh talking about the liberation of the camps and one of the survivors um recall seeing a, a black soldier there just lying down and he looked <laughs> yeah so there were there were black units who arrived just days after the, the camps were liberated um, and like everyone else who got to the camps, they were horrified at what they at what they saw, um, and a lot of that comes back and um, is referenced in black newspapers uh, at, at the time. So, and one of the things I didn't get to highlight here today, but um, black newspapers, and black Americans were among the first to recognize what a really serious threat the Nazis posed. Uh, so, if you looked at a black newspaper from 1933, 34, 35, you would see dozens of articles and essays talking about the rise of Hitler in Germany. Uh, and why it was such a, a significant threat. Because they see that Hitler is drawing on American racial policies to help justify his treatment of Jews in, in Europe. And they see that as Jews are being surrogated on train cars, and as their property is being stolen, and as communities are being um, harassed and, and killed, that a lot of that resembles what was happening to black Americans in the Jim Crow South. And so at the same time, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, other Americans aren't paying as close of attention to what's going on in Europe. Black Americans are among the first to, to really recognize this is something that uh, has to be stopped. So, Harry Truman abolishes segregation and the military after the war. Um, did you come across, it's not where you were researching, but did you come across any discussion about discussions prior to Truman's presidency of why they didn't desegregate? Yeah, thanks for asking. So may I, I'll repeat the question back just to make sure people are unlikely to hear them. So the question was about um, President Truman signing an executive order in 1948 to desegregate the military. And to what extent there's evidence of efforts to have that desegregation happen, happen earlier. So I appreciate you asking about it. Um, one of the things that's important to understand and why it was so frustrating for Black Americans who served in World War II to be treated in this way is that Black Americans have been part of the military for every conflict the United States has ever been a part of, going all the way back to the American Revolution. There's more than 350,000 Black Americans who served in World War I in segregated units um, with the hope that that's going to be a, a step towards equality, both in the military and in society more broadly. And in fact, the exact opposite happens. After World War I, there's a series of race riots all across the country, the so-called Red Summer of 1919. And between World War I and World War II, the military does almost everything they can to push Black Americans out of the service. So in the lead up to World War II before Pearl Harbor, when it becomes clear that America eventually is going to be joining the war effort, there are organized efforts by civil rights activists and by black editors to, um, to really fight for the chance to fight, to try to get black Americans to have a larger role in the military and to try to get integration of the military to happen. One of the things I will usually say about the desegregation of the military in 1948 is that it was both a decade late and a decade early. Um, that there was no reason for the military to be racially segregated. It made no sense strategically or tactically, it was cumbersome. Uh, it was someone's job to figure out how you had separate barracks and recreation facilities and latrines. Like that, that took work and, and costs that could have been better dedicated, dedicated elsewhere. So they could have just as easily integrated in 1938, 
except for the vast amount of racial prejudice that, that blocked that. But when the military does integrate in 1948, it's still early in many ways because it's the first federal institution to become integrated. And so the integration of the military helps to influence the Brown versus Board decision in 54. It influences decisions that corporate America makes, that higher education makes in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and so I think the most direct answer is that part of the reason Truman in, uh, issues that executive order to desegregate in 1948 is that he's been facing the first Roosevelt, but then he facing intense pressure um, in the decade previously. And then it's some of the violence that I mentioned against black troops. Um, there's a particular case of um, Isaac Woodard in South Carolina who's beaten uh, by a sheriff and um, his eyes are gouged out, he's blinded. Um, Truman, Truman was a veteran. And so when news of that reaches him, it, it impacts him uh, even more deeply than I think it would any human who should be about that outrage by that kind of violence. And so it was that the persistent um, pressure to integrate coupled with the, the violence that he sees happening and his, his own kind of personal reaction to that as a veteran. Um, the December meeting of difficult conversations about race is going to be looking at the idea of reparations for African Americans. I was wondering if you could talk about the bill that is currently um, in process for um, black vets. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. So there's um, legislation that's been proposed in both the House and the Senate, and we'll see how everything shakes out of it, whether it even has a chance to, to reach any sort of debate. Um, called the GI Bill Restoration Act. Um, and I wrote a longer piece about this for Mother Jones magazine that came out about a month ago and it's available for free online. Um, so if you just Google my name and Mother Jones, you'll be able to find it. What the GI Bill Restoration Act attempts to do is to uh, enable the surviving family members of Black World War II veterans to be able to access the GI Bill benefits that they were denied during their lifetimes. Um, I think a lot of you probably know something about the history of the GI Bill, but I'll try to trace it briefly here. Um, the GI Bill was legislation that was passed near the end of World War II. And it's perhaps the most important legislation that was passed in the 20th century. Uh, it's what enabled a whole generation of white veterans to be able to enter the middle class because it provided access to low interest home mortgages that were backed by the VA, it provided access to college tuition benefits, to job placement benefits, to low, in, uh, low interest uh, business loans. So it was a, a, a huge federal bounty of resources that were given disproportionately to, to white veterans. When the legislation is being crafted, uh, it goes through committees that are largely controlled by white Southern senators, folks like James O. Eastland, who were not elected democratically. I think it's important to recognize that Eastland's elected at the time when only 1% of black Mississippians are registered to vote, even though they make up nearly 50% of the population, right? They're not registered to vote because of decades of intentional violence and discrimination, things like poll taxes. But you have folks like Eastland in, who have been in DC for years who have positions of seniority on these key committees. They make sure when the GI Bill is drafted that it's going to be um, uh, distributed at the state level. Everyone in 1944, 1945 knows what that means. Right? If you do things at the federal level, there's a chance you can have provisions that make sure there's not discrimination. If you do things at the state level, it means you're deferring to the racial prejudices of those, those different localities. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, when black veterans go to their local veterans offices to try to access their benefits in the South, they're largely turned away. Um, or they're, they're given the runaround and told that they can't get access to the things that they um, thought they'd be able to access. Um, for higher education, um, uh, throughout the South, uh, colleges at that point are still entirely segregated. And so despite black colleges being very resilient and resourceful, they just don't have enough seats to be able to accommodate the thousands and thousands of black veterans who want to be able to go to college. And none of the white colleges are accepting black veterans in the South. Outside of the South, places like Dartmouth and elsewhere have essentially quotas on how many black students they'll take. So they'll take a handful of students, but they're not in a position to take the, the thousands of black veterans who want to go to college. Uh, for mortgages, um, they don't put any provisions in the GI Bill that uh, make sure that mortgages are distributed without discrimination. So that means they defer to the existing discrimination within the mortgage and banking industries. And so this is true outside of the South as well. In New York, New Jersey, black veterans can't get mortgages to live in, in most, most areas. By 1950, 98% of those VA-backed mortgages go to white veterans, only 2% black veterans. Uh, there's a group at Brandeis who's done research on sort of calculating what this would look like. These are economists at Brandeis. And what they found is that overall, these GI Bill benefits were worth to black veterans only about 40% of what they were worth to white veterans. And over a lifetime, that's about a $100,000 difference. 
And so when I think about the vast racial wealth gap that exists in the country, a large part of that can get traced back to the GI Bill. So I think as it circles back to the question of reparations, obviously slavery is always going to be a foundational part of that, but we don't even need to go back that far, <clears throat> go back to one's grandparents, right, and be able to see how that um, those federal funds that help make it possible for someone's family to buy a home, to get a job, to go to college, to be able to pass those benefits on to the next generation, makes a huge split. Um, I think the last couple pieces that I mentioned here, it, part of the reason the GI Bill is so important is that it changed what was considered normal in American society. Prior to the war, home ownership was not prevalent. Uh, going to college was not prevalent. Those were things that were unique to really upper, uh, upper class folks. The GI Bill makes that something that's possible to a much, much larger portion of, of the white population. So if, if it had been possible for more black Americans, black veterans to partake in that, it would have had a dramatic impact on who could enter the middle class. And the final piece I'll mention is that it's important to remember that um, some black veterans are able to access those GI Bill benefits. There, there are thousands of black veterans who are able to access the benefits. And they go on to do tremendous, tremendous things. So two of the people I just mentioned, W. Johnson Roundtree, uses the GI Bill to go to Howard University Law School, right? becomes a, a pioneering lawyer. Robert Madison uses it to become an architect. Right? So a part of the story of the GI Bill is not only the massive discrimination, but it's also an opportunity cost. Like if that discrimination hadn't been there, we would have had a whole other generation of black engineers and doctors and lawyers that we didn't have because of, they weren't allowed to access the benefits in the same way. Hmm. Excuse me, um, Matt. We've had a request on Zoom for you to end screen sharing. People want to see you full screen now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hi to everyone on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining your moment. Hi. So I was nine years old in Sumter, South Carolina, when World War II ended. And um, I had two cousins. One was in the Battle of the Bulge, and the other was, of course, I was a nine-year-old and, you know, successively not that much older when stories might have been told. So anything that I remember, which is clear to me now in some of my memory, but not full, I remember that uh, Dick Jr. was in the Pacific Theater, and I did check out your Pacific Theater section of your book, but I didn't see anything that resonated. I remember that he was in the Philippines, or was that okay? And so I'm really curious as to whether or not I can look him up as a, of course, he died some years ago. He actually took his own life. Um, and I, I'm just interested if I can... Is there a list? I saw the list of deceased members from World War II, but I didn't see any list that would show, show his name. That's a great question. Um, I, I'm happy to chat more, more afterwards. So I think usually if you can, it's helpful if you can identify what unit they might have been a part of. Um, the, sometimes the, the Veterans Administration will have information on the service records of different people who have served. And so that's okay. often the, the best place to start would be looking at veteran administration records. Okay. If you can figure out which unit they were a part of, uh, then you have a chance to see where they deployed and get a sense of like where within the Philippines they might have been or where they were stationed in the United States. Um, and then beyond that, it's it's a matter of luck, honestly, about how much there there is in terms of records. Sure. Um, there was a big um, fire at one of the main records depots in Kansas City a number of years ago in the 1970s that uh, meant that a lot of records from World War II were lost. Um, but if you can try to work through the Veterans Administration, see which unit they might have been a part of, and then try to trace the story in that way. What's, what's even more significant after listening to you today, listening to you with Jonathan Capehart and uh, some other interviews I've heard from you, um, I know that he, and Dick Jr. was his name, I know that Dick Jr. was a good Southern boy, and he was a captain, and he was in charge of I don't even know the terms militarily, but a group, a uh, regiment maybe, I don't know. Um, I don't know regiment for battalion, but <clears throat> he was in charge of, of black soldiers. And, um, but there were no family stories. And of course, I'm the one, one family member left now, but maybe his uh, sons will have some stories. I don't know. Yeah, um, it's, yeah. It's really an interesting subject to probe into, and thank you very much. And thank you for mentioning it. So one of the um, misnomers you when I describe these segregated units is that the majority of the black units that were in World War II had white commanders, right? And so they, they were segregated up until they got to the, the officer level. Sure. Um, so that might be another, that 
would actually be interesting if you knew which unit he was leading. There might be some history on the black troops within that unit. Maybe some of them gave oral history interviews um, that could tell you something about the, the service there. Um, but the, the question of leadership was, was really important. Black units, um, they could tell when their white officers respected them or not. And a lot of that comes through in, in the memories in the, of the veterans they gave later. Thank you. So one of the line is asking to what extent you feel uh, racial discrimination still exists in the military today? That's a, a really good and challenging question. <laughs> uh, so the answer in two ways. Um, one, there's absolutely still uh, racial discrimination and racism, racism in the military, um, as there is in every institution in the country. Uh, I think the thing that the military is dealing with right now is that it has become a locus of both some of the most um, forward-looking policies with regards to inclusion, at the same time, it is a home to a lot of people who hold very strong white nationalist beliefs. Um, that, that's very hard to hold those two things together. Um, and so a part of the, the continuing ongoing racism problem the Army has and the military has is that it hasn't done enough to, um, to push white nationalists out of the service or to make it a, a space that is going to be completely inhospitable to white nationalism. Um, and it's also so to work on um, dealing with the history of, of racism and racist symbols within the military. And so it's just a couple of years ago, they stopped allowing the Confederate flag to be flown on military bases, right? which is one of those more mind blowing things because the Confederacy was at war with the US military and it's, it trans it's the whole, whole story. Um, but I think a more positive story goes back to the point about desegregation in the military in 1948. Since the military desegregated in 1948, it's been among institutions on the, the more leading edge in terms of trying to um, to be the kind of organization that can welcome and support people from all different backgrounds in American society, right? I think demographically, the military is much more diverse than higher education is. It's much more diverse than corporate America is. Um, and so I think the military has a lot of credentials there. And we now have generations of um, black servicemen and women, Latinx, black, Latinx servicemen and women um, who have had careers in the military and who see it as a, a place where they could um, have successful, successful careers. Um, I think no institution is perfect, but the military, by its nature, since it became an all-volunteer force after Vietnam, has had to address some of the issues with racism because they're drawing on people of color um, much beyond their percentage of the population. So they've needed to address some of that racism more forthrightly than other parts of the uh, other parts of the country. You you mentioned that there was a lot of pressure uh, at, before Truman desegregated the military. Was the pressure coming essentially exclusively from blacks or were, were there, I mean, they're fighting the Eastland type of politicians, but was, were there whites who at that time were, were actually fighting alongside? By and large, almost all the protests in terms of desegregating the military was coming from, from black Americans. Uh, there were a handful this is before the end of the war. There are a handful of uh, white officials in the military, white officers, who recognize that this segregation doesn't make sense. Right? That they, they, they're upset personally by the treatment that they see um, black, black troops receiving. And beyond that, they, just, they understand it doesn't make sense to segregate. They're a very, very small minority of the, the white military leadership over the time. And so the lion's share of activism is coming from black troops. One of the things that changes at the end of the war is that then they have um, some evidence they can point to. They can look at the performance of black units and see how well um, black units have performed during the war. One of the things that happens between World War I and World War II is the Army starts publishing reports that claim that black uh, Americans just don't have what it takes to, to perform well in the military, that they don't have the intelligence, the courage, the bravery, that they're making all these sort of outrageous claims, like they're scared of the dark, and as soon as the battle starts, they'll run away. Um, but these, these, are the, these aren't like isolated racist opinions, like these are their official documents that they're teaching people at West Point and teaching military officers. By World War II, you have more people who have now worked in much closer proximity to, to black troops. They've led them, they've seen them perform in combat, they've seen them perform behind the scenes in these supply roles. And so they can say, we'll be a better fighting force if we become desegregated. We can actually take advantage of the, the manpower, people power of all American citizens. So that part comes more from, from white leaders after, after the war. And that is much more pragmatic. So it's not a, the term political correctness doesn't exist at the time. Um, they're not doing it from a place of um, kind of moral righteousness about the evils of racism. They're just saying very practically, we're military men. 
next time we go to a conflict or in a war, we're going to be a better fighting force if we get rid of segregation. Right? Just pragmatically, that's what they do. That's what they do. I um, was in the Marine Corps, and I was at uh, Paris Island for three months, and then wound up in Coronado, California, training with the uh, returning Na Navy SEALs from Vietnam. When I was at Paris Island, my drill instructor was an African-American man by the name of E.C. Jones, Sergeant E.C. Jones. And I can assure you, this guy was the most highly respected black man at, at Paris Island. He was, he was um, tough as nails. He had served two terms in Vietnam. Um, we won the drill competition on the drill parade deck every single time we entered it. This guy was all about precision. I mean, he was no BS. You either performed or you were you were no longer a squad leader. I mean, he just moved people around and you either did it or you didn't do it. Um, he wound up re-upping, or not re-upping, I guess he was in the service all the way along, but he wound up going back to Vietnam. Uh, in the early 70s and was killed over there. Uh, in, in, incredible. <laughs> I, I have such a memory of this guy. He was, uh, <laughs> including a time when I transgressed, I can't remember what I did, but I remember standing outside of the drill instructor's office and he had his, he had his um, chalkboard stick and he was telling me because I had been, I think I'd been caught writing a letter um, in the, during, um, we, we were, um, we were working with our weapons and we were, either you were on the firing line shooting or you were in the, down the butts, you know, putting up the targets and this, that, and I was down there and I was caught writing a letter or something. And so I was asked to come in front of the drill instructor's office and we got back to the barracks. And he stood there with his, with, with his chalk pointer telling me by knocking me right here with his, with his why that, that, that kind of uh, attitude and those transgressions were not acceptable in this unit. I mean, I'll never forget it, you know? But he did not discriminate among anybody. He was just all about performance, and I'll never forget him. So and there's a story um, of, a, of a black man I really admired. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, it makes me remember, um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it much here, but the Marine Corps' experience during World War II with regards to race was, was transformational. Because at the start of the war, they don't allow any black men to serve at all. And the commandant at the time says, uh, he would rather have a Marine Corps of 5,000 white Marines and 25,000 black Marines. So he says under his watch, they're never going to be, never going to be inter integration at all. But by uh, late 1942, the first uh, training unit set up at Montford Point in North Carolina, the Montford Point Marines, the first black Marines. And they go on to distinguish themselves at the battles of Saipan and Iwo Jima. Um, and what's important there is the, the new commandant who comes in uh, in 42 or 43, um, he has a very different perspective. He sees the performance of these black Marines and he judges them on their performance as Marines. He, he issues those statements and says, you know, they've, they've proven themselves they're 100% Marines. Like, the, the distance that the Marine Corps travels in just three years, right? Because they give these black soldiers a, a chance to, to prove themselves, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, as you, as you say, by Vietnam, the, the Marine Corps and the Army, the, the military, is a, it's a very different institution, right? You have uh, black Americans taking on roles that had been uh, denied to them previously and performing in integrated units, and, um, and creating lasting memories like my family. Right. Um, I have two things. One is in your book, you talk about the fact that you can trace the reticence to speak honestly about white supremacy um, back to World War II, back to that time. That was one. I wonder if you could comment about that. And um, the second is, what does it mean um, to African Americans that what the general term, the greatest generation, doesn't include, has wiped out any of the um, efforts of African Americans. 
Those are great questions, and I think they're both connected. Um, so in the first, in terms of how we can trace the reticence to talk honestly about white supremacy back to World War II, um, I think what's, what's so exciting about being a historian is you get to go back and look at these primary sources. Right? You get to look at uh, newspaper articles, look at um, letters people wrote at the time, look at archival documents that are published by the military and by others, um, and then look at oral history interviews that the veterans give in the decades after. And then you try to put all those puzzle pieces together. Right? If you go back and look, and look at that evidence, it's clear that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of racism, a lot of tension in the United States during World War II. And I think that's not how we typically talk about that period of time. Right? That, I think for a lot of Americans, when they think about World War II, they think somehow it was a more unified time for the country, um, that it was uh, a simpler time, a more, a more not peaceful in the sense of at war, but that domestically things were, were more peaceful, or, or, and that people were sacrificing for a common, a common effort. The evidence is exactly the contrary. Right? In 1943 alone, there are more than 240 race riots all across the country. Um, in cities and towns and on army bases. Um, in the defense industries at home, there are a number of what they call hate strikes, where these are not uh, authorized by unions, but they're white workers who decide that they're not going to work that week um, because black workers have been hired into these factories or because they in Baltimore, for example, they desegregated the bathroom and the plant shut down because white workers would rather not work than have to use the same bathroom as black workers. Seeing some of those examples, it really makes it clear that the nation was not unified behind a single war effort. That people weren't sacrificing everything. Right? There was there was a huge amount of huge number of sacrifices during World War II. But what America was not willing to sacrifice on, or at least what not enough white Americans were willing to sacrifice on, was any changes to the racial status quo. Uh, one of my favorite quotes in the book is uh, from Roy Wilkins, who was a, uh, one of the NAACP leaders, who said, um, "White Americans would rather lose this war than give up the luxury of race prejudice." Right? And there's so much evidence to back that up. And so I think part of our reticence to talk honestly about white supremacy since World War II is that if we can point back to a period of time and say there was a supposedly better, more simpler time that we would like to harken back to and that somehow things went off track in the 60s or went off track with Black Lives Matter or whatever it is, those things seem like a surprise or an anomaly. Um, there are no surprises or anomalies in American history, right? We've always been this way. Like, there have always been these aspects of racial tension, of racial inequality. Um, and I think our, we do a disservice to ourselves as, as citizens to, to not talk honestly about that history, because then we are left uh, unmoored trying to make sense of why those issues are still with us today. Right? Voting rights is still an issue today because voting rights has always been an issue. Right? Um, and so I think it leads to the second question, because the idea of the greatest generation or the good war is the, uh, it's part of the way that we talk about this history in simplistic, uh, simplistic whitewash terms. Um, and it's frustrating as a historian, because even if you look back at Tom Brokaw's book, where the term comes from, Great Generation, he actually he has profiles of, of black veterans. He has profiles of Japanese Americans who are interned, right? And so that book isn't a simplistic book, but that shorthand, Greatest Generation, becomes almost an armor to only celebrate the time period without ever investigating it critically. Um, and I should also be clear, I mean, there's a huge amounts to celebrate about that generation of Americans, right? That was a war that had to be won, right? The Nazis had to be defeated and everything that white Americans did to help make that possible was obviously something to celebrate. But the reality is that too many white Americans were willing to return to a country that still authorized legal racial apartheid. Right? That's not something to celebrate. Right? Um, I think that's what's so frustrating thing for the majority of black Americans, right? Is that you celebrate only the positive things without talking about the, the less salutary. Um, I am largely ambivalent about the idea of the term greatest generation, um, but I think it's probably going to be with us for a number of years. And so I think if we do think about the greatest generation, we have to think about black veterans, right? because they both did the military aspect. They helped to win the war militarily. But then they also came back and fought to make America an actual functioning democracy. They fought to make America a country worth fighting for. Um, and that aspect of patriotism and dissent going together, uh, I think is a, is a really profound one that I think we would do well to bring back into our political culture today. Like, you don't have to choose between being a patriot and someone who is critical of the country and want to see it do better. For African Americans, it's always been two sides of the uh, Thank you. That's great. Um, there's one more. Um, I'll leave it to you to decide if this question is too tangential to your presentation, but someone is asking, in your opinion, what can one do to be anti-racist in the United States today? <laughs> in our last two minutes. <laughs> Good luck on that one. Um, 
Well, I'll, I'll answer in a, the most straightforward way possible. I, I would say two things. One, I think um, continue to educate oneself. Right? I think um, understanding history, I mean, I'm a historian, so I'm biased. But understanding history and all of its dimensions, all of its complexity, I think is one of our obligations as citizens, right? I think it doesn't matter what political party you belong to, right? This history is this history, regardless who's in the White House or who has control of Congress, right? And so we, we can't have any conversation in a democracy without, without a shared understanding of history that, that's rooted in evidence, right? These aren't just random opinions, like these are actual pieces of evidence. I think that's the first part. And I think the second is, is act locally, right? That the structures of racial discrimination in our country are massive and have been built over generations and generations. They're not going to get fixed automatically or in any sort of media period of time. And so trying to work together with groups of local um, uh, community members and citizens, much like the group that's gathered here today, to study together, learn together, and think about what are the, um, the levers that one can pull in their own sphere of action to make small changes to do something that's slightly better. Um, I'd like to um, have the last word here, unless you feel how it needs to have the last word, just to um, thank you so much, um, Matt Delmont, for coming and for this wonderful presentation. Thank you also to Hal for um, for providing the coordination for this. And thank you all for being courageous enough to show up. And to those people who showed up on Zoom, um, I'll see you all in December on Zoom when we talk about reparations. Thank you.